Dr. Vinay Prasad here, and I'm back to discuss the vision trial. This is Lutetium 177 PSMA. This is the New England Journal of Medicine paper, and people are buzzing about it because what do we love the most in this world of oncology? Radionucleotides, am I right? Well, this is a very interesting, interesting paper. So let me walk you through what I found about it and uh, why I say it's really quite something, quite something that I've read. So here it is. Lutetium, 177 PSMA, metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer. Now we know the prostate cancer landscape has changed a lot since I trained in oncology when all we had was Tanox legendary paper of docetaxel. Now we have a lot of other options. Some are quite good and improve overall survival such as abiraterone and enzalutamide. And now we have Lutetium, 177 PSMA. This is an active compound. No one doubts that. It can generate responses. This randomized trial purports to show how it can be used to leverage improved patient outcomes. And I've got some concerns about it, so let me walk you through. First of all, what do they do? Long story short, they took people who had PSMA-positive metastatic cancer-resistant disease on PSMA PET that was defined as at least one PSMA-positive lesion and no PSMA-negative lesions, and they have some criteria for what counts as a PSMA-negative lesion depending on the size and, and the uptake. But be that as it may, what you need to know is that of 1,000 people who got screened with this PSMA PET scan, which by the way, it's not available everywhere, but they'd like it to be someday, 82% were eligible for this study. So it's not everybody with metastatic crash resistant prostate cancer. You have to meet this PSMA inclusion criteria. You were then randomized to receive lutetium PSMA plus standard care. They call it standard care versus standard care alone. Well, that's where things get interesting. What the hell? exactly counts as standard care. I started to read this paper and I got a little bit perplexed, uh, but first I should show you the main result. The main result, of course, is that they have a whopping imaging-based PFS benefit, a OS benefit that is a four-month OS benefit that's not uh, to be sneezed at, that's a real benefit, um, but it's contingent on the particular control arm, which we're gonna talk about. What's the problem? Here's the problem. Standard care therapies could not include cytotoxic chemotherapy. So no cabazitaxel. It couldn't include systemic radioisotopes such as radium-223. No, you're not allowed. It couldn't include immunotherapy or drugs that were investigational when this trial progressed, such as elaparib for the uh, BRCA1, BRCA2. Let's not talk about ATM, uh, but for BRCA1, BRCA2 or other homologous recombination deficiency repair problems. Permitted treatments were not restricted to the approved, oh, so this is what they could include, hormonal treatments, including abiraterone and enzalutamide. Well, unfortunately, you've had at least one, and the other one's not so great when you've had one, and some people have had both. You could, of course, get the standard treatment for prostate cancer of a bisphosphonate. Yeah, last I checked, that improves skeletal-related events, but that's not exactly an anti-cancer treatment, okay? Radiation therapy, palliative radiation for metastatic disease. Yeah, that's not exactly my go-to systemic therapy. Denosumab, oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the denosumab. Or glucocorticoids at any dose. Oh, you can have whatever dose glucocorticoid you want. Good, good. Uh, uh, all terrible, terrible treatments for this population. Nobody would ever want to give any of these things, but you can give them in combination with um, your lutetium PSMA. And in fact, people had had a lot of these treatments before. So these are the number of people who had an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor. 55% had at least one regimen, about 40% had had two. So now that you've had two, you've had Enza and Abby, you can get Enza again. Bravo, this is a lot like profound, as in profoundly bad. This is a bad control arm, nobody would want to do this. Previous taxing therapies, 50% of the people in this study had only seen docetaxel. 97% of those people had seen, do it's, it's largely docetaxel. So about half had seen docetaxel and maybe 40% had seen two regimens, which might've been docetaxel, paclitaxel, we don't know. Um, but uh, of that 40% had seen cabazi. So we have some sense of, of dosi, cabazi. They might as well have just listed paclitaxel so it would have been obvious to everybody. Um, what does this mean? This means this is the population where 50% of people could have gotten cabazitaxel which is probably what a lot of people would do in the real world. Why? Because the CARD trial where cabazitaxel tested against an androgen signaling inhibitor has a survival benefit of a couple months. So this control arm, they're deprived of a standard of care therapy. Now, if imagine I was a patient enrolling on this study or a doctor, well, a doctor, I would, wouldn't have a lot of respect for myself to enroll on this study because it is an unethical, egregious, and horrible control arm. 
But if I was a patient enrolling on this study and I learned that I've been randomized to the control arm that prevented me from taking a lot of life prolonging drugs um, for a capricious reason, I might say, to hell with this study, I'm dropping out. And in fact, that's what happened. But before I get to that, I wanna point out one thing. This phenomenon of a poor control arm is quite popular in the literature. This is an analysis that Derek Tao and I did uh, a couple of years ago in the Lancet Oncology. We asked, are we testing trivialities? When you test your novel drug against old drugs or restrictions on drugs um, in ways that we don't actually practice. Later, Halal Halal, who's now in Mississippi, he led this paper that we published in JAM Oncology, Analysis of Control Arm Quality. We looked at all the US Food and Drug Administration approvals that were based on randomized control trials, maybe about two thirds, we looked at those control arms. We found roughly one in five are problematic control arms. This is one of them. And if you look at genital urinary, y'all not doing so well, GU docs. Two out of every three are good, but one out of every three trials you're running is a suboptimal control arm. And this study, vision, fits right there. So what happened? Indeed, what happened, patients did exactly what I suspected they would do. After the trial started, a high incidence of withdrawal from the trial was noted in the control group and at certain sites probably sites where they have other options, and was attributed principally to patient disappointment. That's not so good. You can't run a trial with a control arm so lousy that patients are literally disappointed and withdraw consent when they match under the control arm. After discussion with regulatory authorities, we implemented enhanced trial site education measures. Oh, indoctrination on March 5th, 2019 to reduce the incidence of withdrawal. So we tried to indoctrinate patients to stay on our lousy unethical control arm. That's what you did? How is that acceptable? And you discussed it with regulators. Did they approve of this? Or did you just mention you might do this? This is, this is disgraceful. I find that very disgraceful. Look, the percent of patients in the control group who discontinued the trial without receiving the randomly side treatment was 56% of patients before the implementation of these measures. 56%? Get out of here. That's astonishingly high. And I'm about to show you some empirical data that shows just how horribly high that is. Patients are sniffing out that you're giving them a dilapidated, delinquent, and unethical control arm. And after you did your brainwashing sessions on them, you dropped it down to 16.3%. How is this ethical? You're indoctrinating them to stay on this lousy study, even though they've been assigned to arguably detrimental malpractice standard of care. And in the intervention arm, it was 1.2% and 4.2%. Everyone's happy to get your lutetium PSMA. That's why they're enrolling on the study. So let's put this in perspective. Thankfully, we have a paper that actually can help put this in perspective. This is Kate Rosen, medical student at OHSU, Emerson Chen, now faculty at OHSU, and myself. We looked at all trials that were published in one journal where you can actually find out how many people are censored or lost to the study at every single time point. And this was based on the Lancet Oncologies, which has a, a practice of reporting censored patients in brackets, which my understanding is was pushed for by Tito Foho, my old and great program director. Here's what you need to know. When you look at Kaplan-Meier curve, there are people at risk at every time point. And at the next time point, uh, there's a fewer number of people at risk. There's one of four reasons, you know, your, one of four things can happen to you at any time point in a Kaplan-Meier curve. One, you can experience the event of interest. That's when there's a little tick down. Two, you can continue to be at risk for the event of interest. So that's, you're in the denominator. Or three, you're censored. And there's two reasons you can be censored. You haven't been followed long enough, or you've been lost to follow up or you dropped out. And those are the four things that can happen at any time point. Here in brackets, in the Lancet Oncology Journals, they actually tell you how many people experience events three and four. So we can figure out how many people are censored at every time point. And you can start to see that if there's imbalances in censoring, if there's a lot more people censored in one arm than the other, that's not attributable to late enrollment. Late enrollment will be balanced between the two arms because surprise, surprise, it's randomized. So that should be balanced. It's attributable to people withdrawing for other reasons. So. Our paper has many, many figures and you should read it. And there's a lot of points that are, that are worth discussing. But for this paper, I'll only show one pain of one figure. And that's this pain. This is the difference in the number of patients censored at a very early time point in the study. So in other words, dots to the right show you that there are more patients who are censored or fall off the study in the control arm early on than dots to the left show more patients on the intervention arm fall off very early. And what you see here is the weighted average is slightly right of center. And this is, this is patient disappointment. This is patients who are assigned to control arms that they drop out the study, they drop out early. 
And I think we see that when you look at aggregate data, of course, the vertical axis here is the sample size of the study and the uh, Horizontal axis is the difference between the two arms. Right means more control arm censoring, left means more interventional arm censoring. Okay, so that's what you're looking at here. So there is a trend. There is this thing called patient disappointment. I think it exists. I think we've proven it in this paper. Now, let me show you where vision trial falls. Vision. It's way the hell out here. Look at that. 50%, it's off the charts. I've never seen anything like it. And even after their indoctrination sessions to cajole and deceive patients into participating in your unethical control arm, you still drop it down pretty close to, I think that other dot is quizartinib um, in leukemia. And by the way, that quizartinib issue that came to an FDA discussion and they actually didn't approve it because of this horrific imbalance in censoring at that early time point, suggesting massive withdrawal, which means all your downstream endpoints are a little bit unreliable because you have induced imbalance into your randomized controlled trial. Anyway, this is bad. This is off the charts bad. Everyone knew this was bad. The patients knew it was bad. Maybe even the investigators knew it was bad. This is almost unjustifiably bad. The rationale, and this is how they try to they try to explain it to themselves. The rationale for the exclusion of certain treatments was that the safety profile of these therapies had not been established in combination with lutetium PSMA. Well, that's your fault. You need to do that. Do that before you run your study. Or that justifies lutetium PSMA with a limited number of drugs on the intervention arm, but what justifies handicapping the control arm to delinquent therapy? You can allow the control arm to get cabazitaxel too. The trial aimed to assess the effect. Oh, I don't want to read that. That's boring me. Patients who received only one taxane were ineligible if they were deemed at baseline to be candidates for receiving a second taxane. Is that true? So if they had only received docetaxel, but they could have received cabazitaxel, then they were ineligible for your study? I don't think that's true. Here's why I don't think that's true. Because after your study occurred, 38 or 20% of the people who got any post-protocol care got cabazitaxel. Surely after their time was wasted on your negligent control arm, if they can still get cabazitaxel, they could have gotten cabazitaxel before they participated in your study, surely. So I think I disagree with that statement. I don't think that's accurate. So what's my takeaway of this lutetium PSMA study? I really don't like it. In fact, I spilled my coffee all over it because I spit it out when I read this study. This is, this is bad. This is a big problem. Now, people who like this drug will say, well, we just wanted to show it had activity. You don't need a control arm to show it has activity. You can show it has activity by giving it to people and showing a response rate. No one doubts that your incredibly high dose radionucleotide is gonna have activity, okay? I don't really doubt that that's the case. What I wanna know is in the landscape of prostate cancer, how can I use this drug to improve survival or quality of life for my patients? Now, you might say your trial's control arm reflects the standard of care globally. I'll tell you what, the places where this control arm reflects the standard of care, they can't afford your lutetium PSMA. They don't have a PSMA PET scanner. This only applies to this country, the United States, where we're gonna spend the horrific amounts of money on your drug. So you need to use a control arm that's appropriate for our country. I find this study disgraceful. It's emblematic of all the problems in oncology. You are showing how disgraceful it is when the patients are throwing in the towel the moment they learn they get assigned to the control arm. Vision trial, get out of here. I see right through it. The New England Journal of Medicine, they did one thing. They changed, I suspect they changed the abstract to say protocol permitted standard of care. I bet that wasn't on the original medical writer version. I suspect they made them say that, but that's not drawing a line in the sand. The journal has abdicated their responsibility. The profession has abdicated their responsibility. These types of studies are not what we need in oncology. So the vision trial, two thumbs down. And if I see any more prostate cancer studies like this, you're gonna get this treatment on this, uh, on this show and maybe somebody might be persuaded by it. So on that negative note, we will turn to the next topic um, and a future video. So if you like this video, subscribe to the channel, check out Plenary Session Podcast, read the book Malignant. It describes many such examples. And uh, this is all, this is the same old trick.